let's stand all together and we'll worship this morning. Hallelujah.
of the Lord together at one service. We're not dividing between two, but we're at the one, so it's wonderful to be together here with you. 
if you would get my notes out here turn to Genesis chapter 13 Genesis chapter 13 I, while we're turning there I do want to just say thank you to those that were helping yesterday on the concrete project as we were working on uh, making sure the, the little grassies have the water that they need to grow we had stained the concrete a little bit and so there was a work a group out here yesterday that was working on that so thank you for the work that you put in taking that rust away thank you very very much Genesis chapter 13 starting in verse 5 we're going to read to verse 12 Genesis 13 verse 5 and Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite, the Perizzite, dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. I pray thee, this is Abram, never liked contention. And to fix it, he just says, You know what, Lot, between me and thee, between my herdman and thy herdsman, for we be brethren, let there be no contention, let there be no strife. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest from Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. And he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Let's pray real quick that the Lord would just allow the burden he has given me to flow from my voice and across this pulpit to you. That your hearts would receive God's word for you today. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for your presence, oh Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in this church, in our lives, God, and in our hearts. I just ask that you would bless and anoint this time. That Jesus, you would move upon every heart, God. That we would hear your word speak to us. We love you, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I titled my message, The Greener Grass the greener grass and I want to talk to you today about this story and I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey here we're going to go through kind of what we see here in this scripture that we see in this portion because I want to look at the decision that Lot had made you see we see decisions made by Lot that he chose, to the, he chose to go to the greener side of things. Now, here we like green grass, right? We like green grass. It looks beautifully green out there right now. And if, if two houses are for sale and one, lot, one house is, is a big building and it's, it's a beautiful house and the other house is not as big, but the grass in the not as big house is greener. And the grass in the other house, in their lot, is maybe a little bit more brown. Which one do you think is going to sell a little bit quicker? <laughs> the greener grass, because it looks nicer. It's more presentable. It look, it's more attractive to the eye. 
And a lot of times in life, we often like to choose the better option, right? We like to choose things that look better for our situation. We like to choose the greener grass. It's very common. It's something very normal for us to choose the greener side of life. So this is what you need to know. Lot got into trouble chasing the greener grass. Whenever we read this story, the Bible says it was a well-watered land, and I don't believe that was a pond. I believe that it was a well-watered area. It means that there was plenty of water to go around. And as the Garden of Eden, before it was destroyed, the Garden of the Lord is what it says. Ecclesiastes 4 and 4 says, Again I considered all travail and every right work, that for this is a man envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of the spirit. So keeping up with the Joneses is a new term, but the principle has been around for thousands of of years. And I just want to talk about this idea that we we have this fulfillment that often we can feel and often we can uh, have in our in our lives whether it be at work, whether it be at school, whether it be just on our our daily neighbor. Sometimes we compare ourselves to the other person. I do it I, I struggle with that. I, I like to compare things. Um, whenever I'm purchasing something, I compare a lot. And I do extensive research. You can ask my wife. It drives her nuts because I will not buy anything until I have done almost weeks of comparing. Well, this it does have this perk, but the other one, it, it well, it, it got this good thing about it. And so... We have, as, as humans, we have this, this thing in us that quickly just compares things in life, but also compares ourselves to other people. So working to surpass one's neighbor and their achievements, it's like chasing the wind. It's meaningless. There's really nothing that you're going to accomplish by doing that. Now, why am I talking about this? It's because whenever we read this story, we look at Lot. Now, in this situation, Abram should have been the one to choose where he wanted to go. It was to Abram that the promise was given. It was to Abram that God said, I have given you this land. But Abram said, you know what, Lot? You go ahead and choose first. You go ahead and, and see and look to see where you want to go. And this is where Lot I believe that there was an expectation from the world that Lot fell, felt. I believe he felt that expectation, that there was this almost mythical person that he needed to be. It was almost this, this person that had everything that he needed to be. And he realized, well, if I go towards Sodom and Gomorrah, what? big cities, and they got everything I need in the well-watered area, I, I think I'm going to be able to become this person that the world has put in my life, this expectation that the world gives us. But the truth is, is God is the one who gives us the real expectations of who we need to be. The Bible is the, one, is the place where we receive the ideal expectation of who we need to be in God. And there is more fulfillment that we receive from God's word and being who God wants us to be than this world could ever give us. And I'm going to talk about that more in this message. In Genesis 14, we read that Abram ended up saving Lot. There were kings that wanted to go and attack, and, and they captured Sodom and Gomorrah. And during the capturing of Sodom and Gomorrah, they captured Lot, and they captured Lot's possessions. In a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, you'd say, all of a sudden, everything Lot had went for was gone. Everything that he had looked towards, well, that side looks better, so I want the side that looks more productive. I'm going to choose that side because it's going to be better for me. And he trusted that, but in a moment, everything he had was gone. 
It says here in the, in the scripture we read that Abram actually chased that army down and, and went and took all the goods that were stolen. He recovered them all. He saved Lot from his situation, and he recovered all of Lot's goods and then some. And this is what happened at the end. The king of Sodom offered Abram some reward for fighting for them and, and going back. And um, the king said, you know what, Abram, you go choose what you want first. You go into the goods that you took, and you take first what you want. And this is what Abram did. Abram said, no, I'm not going to take anything that you offer. In fact, he said, I'm not going to take a shoelace. <laughs> I'm not going to take a shoe latchet. He wouldn't even take some of the basic things. He said, I'm not going to touch it. Because if I take it, you might say that you have made me rich. Abram understood at this time that it was God that giveth the increase. Abram at this time understood that it was God that was the, that was the major blessing in his life. It wasn't the greener side. It wasn't the greener grass. It was the fact that he had God in his life. That the blessings came and the blessings showed themselves strong. It was the fact that God was in his life that he could see the result of that. Abram knew by not taking the easy increase that God received more glory. And it's not for our own glory. It's for the glory of God that we do things. God wants to show his glory through you to this world. The next chapter begins with God telling Abram, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So this is what you need to know. God gives an exceeding great reward to those that trust and believe in him. Not the world, not what the world tells us and not what the government tells us, not what the political side tells us, not what the schools can tell us, not what education tells us, but what God tells us. Whenever you trust in what God says, there is a reward that comes to you. In talking about greener grass, I want to look at Ecclesiastes, the book. When we look at the book, quickly, if, if you've ever read, read it, 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 um, it, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. It's, it's not something that we think of very, option here, uh, very often here on this earth. Because it goes through about the vanities of life and how this really isn't worth it. And how, well, I looked at everything in life and really nothing, nothing was fulfilling. Nothing was important. I had everything that I had. And by the way, Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. King Solomon was the wisest man who has ever lived. And he was also one of the richest men that has ever lived. And so we look at this. And King Solomon, who had everything. The Bible says that King Solomon, he writes down, says that I held no pleasure. I held no material back from myself. I had everything I could ever want but still, he was unsatisfied. Still, he was unsatisfied. But we actually find in this book advantages of being thankful to God. Because truly, the reward that we have is not in this world alone. It's in the next world to come. It's with the idea of an eternal life that we have once we're finished here on earth. And I want to talk about being thankful to God for what we have and what he has given us. I could ask you a question from Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10. I'm going to go ahead and read that for you. Verse 10 and 11. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what goods is there to the owners thereof? 
saving the beholding of them with their eyes. So in other words, why do billionaires still want to make money? And if any of you here is a, is a billionaire, please talk to me after service here. I'd like to talk to you about a couple things. <laughs> um, but why don't the, the, the wealthy people that we see on the very, very top, why don't we see them retire and just spend out their life with what they have? Solomon refers to himself as the preacher in this book. And in Ecclesiastes, it's understood that increased goods meant increased appetites. This is a result of not having the Spirit of God in the life that you live. Because there was no control. Once they began to taste of something, there wasn't a, a good, modest approach to it. There wasn't a good control of how much they could take in. And quickly, the appetite increased with the possessions that they had. Now, what am I talking about? What I'm saying is, is that the materials on this earth are not worth it. The things that we receive in this world is not the real reward that God has for you. The real reward is in heaven. The real reward is an eternal life with God. That is what God has waiting for you. Now, I'm not talking against wealth. Please understand me. I believe God is into stewardship. I believe that he, is, he wants his people to be a wealthy people. Please understand that. I'm not saying that wealth is bad. What I'm saying is, is that anything on earth that is a desire can be out of control. And whenever it is not controlled by the Spirit of God, it, it can become an idol in our lives. And it can cause destruction in our lives. The Lord is all about stewardship of every part of our life. But this is an example of why people without God are never satisfied. Because God fills something inside of you. There's a void inside of us that only God can fill. The only the presence of God can fill. Only his power can fill in your life. Ecclesiastes 5:19 gives us a better understanding. And it says, "Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God." We get the proper perspective on money and possessions. That a healthy person is one who appreciates and is content with what God has given. And they, whenever they get to this point, whenever they're content, they should consider it a state, a gift from God, whenever they're content with what they have. But this is what I want you to know, that this place of contentment, it's not unattainable. It's a place that every one of us can get to. It's a place that whenever we spend time in the presence of God, we get to this place where we're happy and we're not trying to fight for the next big thing. We're not trying to reach out to the next um, big promotion. We realize that, you know what, maybe God, where I'm at, I'm doing, Lord, I'm going to start to enjoy the things that you've given me. I'm going to start to enjoy the family that you've put in my life. Because family is worth more than any job and promotion. The relationship that you have with your family is so, so important. It's worth more than what you can receive at a job. Ecclesiastes 7 and 14. It reads, In the day of prosperity be joyful, and in the day of adversity consider, God also has set the one over against the other. To the end that man should find nothing after him. In other words, enjoy and be thankful in times of abundance. But when hard times come, do not think that God has abandoned you. There's this idea that's called the theory of retribution. And it prevailed in the Near East. The ancient Near East would be um, the home of early civilizations. What we would now call the Middle East. That was what they called the ancient Near East. 
But there was this idea, okay? The belief was widespread that life operated by cause and effect. In other words, my behavior equals my consequence. But texts like Job, texts like Psalm 73, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5, 44 through 45, deny that there is always a connection on this earth between behavior and material and social well-being. Because it is God who gives and takes away. Whenever we start to question God on that, we take away his sovereignty. And we serve a sovereign God who knows what is best for you on this earth to reach him in heaven. God cares and loves you more than anybody else. More than you can imagine, more than I can understand. And he will take care of you and give you exactly what you need. In Psalm 73, we read a psalm that was written by Asaph. He wrote about his perception of the wicked. It seems like they get all the breaks. They have no rainy days, and it's always sunshine where they are. Can it seem like that some days? You just feel like you're the one that it's raining on. The black cloud just seems to follow me everywhere I go. <laughs> kind of like Eeyore from the cartoon Winnie the Pooh. Like it just, all the time things are just, they're not terrible, but they're really not great. It just seems like sometimes we look at this world and we can see the people that are pushed up, that are glorified, that are praised. It just seems like they have everything. But the truth is that they don't. That they don't. Verse 7, if we read it, it says, Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have more than their heart could wish. In verse 8, they are corrupt, and they speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? This describes a person who has attained everything, and whenever they get to that point, they, know, they begin to lose this understanding that they have a need for a holy God and for an eternal life. Quickly, they become consumed with a temporary vision, and they lose sight of an eternal vision of heaven. But for you, I want you to take note that it is the eternal reward that God has for you that we need to keep our eyes on. In verse 12 we read, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, and they increase in riches. So it looks like they have it all. So in verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and I've washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. In other words, he says, God, look at everything that they have. Every morning that I get up and I pray, it's worth nothing. Every time that I get up and I repent, God, it doesn't produce anything. This was the perception that Asaph had in this portion of the scripture. But here we need to read. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. It was when he stepped into the presence of God that all of a sudden his perception of temporary gain meant nothing. And the perception of an eternal reward that God has for each one of you became very clear and understanding that our reward is not on this earth. Your reward is in heaven. It's being in the presence of a mighty God that heals and restores relationships. It is God that works in your heart in a mighty powerful way. And it's worth more than what you can receive in this world. And I thank God for what he gives us. I thank him for who he is because he loves each one of us. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 tells us that God has planted an eternal perspective in each person's heart. Though many of us fail to recognize and live by it. 
This is what you need to know. Those who dwell in God's presence are oriented towards the future, a future bright with the hope of resurrection. There is a hope for you. Because you're here in this service now, because you desire godly things, because you want to know more about God, and you want to get closer to him, your future is looking bright, church. Your future, no matter how bleak it looks in this world with the situation going on right now with COVID-19, your future is bright. You need to hear that. Your future is positive. There's something God has for this church. A a spirit of revival is working in our hearts. I believe that in each and every one of us. That God is working on us right now as we speak and we have a hopeful future. I had a casual conversation this past month with somebody. It was a casual conversation that turned not casual. They began to tell me how God was doing things in their life, but they started to be specific. They started to tell me how God had answered a request for them. To you and to me, it would be an insignificant request. The, the result of God answering it would be like, well, yeah, the Lord was great. It wasn't a great miracle. And I don't want to give this pretext that miracles have different levels. Sometimes we like to put comparing notes on them, you know. But every miracle is a miracle, no matter how great or how small. And to this person, it was a major miracle. She started talking to me, and she started describing what God had done. And how after God had done it, she gave thanks to God. And as she began to describe the thanks that she had given to God, I felt the presence of the Lord sweep into that room. I felt the presence of God come down. I felt joy. I felt peace. I felt God's love. And it was a wonderful, beautiful presence because somebody was giving thanks out loud to God. There is a powerful thing that happened that happens whenever you take the time to thank God for what he's doing in your life. There's something special that happens. And you know what? God wants to use that to touch the people around you. God wants to use that to reach this world and to shine light into their darkness. They need to hear about the good things that God is doing. She was full of joy. She was full of thankfulness. You could see the stress. just It was ripped off her shoulders. The stress of this world was taken away because thankfulness was poured out to Jesus. There was a wonderful, sweet presence that came over. Everyone can find contentment. I'm coming to a close. Thanking God for his blessings in whatever state we find ourselves brings contentment. Philippians 4 and 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned and whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So how did they do it? How did they find contentment in a world where there was chaos? It seems like we never have enough. The culture is one of finding the next big goal. The culture wants the next big phone, if you say. The culture wants the next big idea, the next big news headliner. They want the next... Big everything. It's the culture that we're surrounded by. And this is what God is trying to tell you. Whenever you're in his presence, there's a contentment that you'll have. You'll be able to start to enjoy what God has given you more. It'll come clearer with understanding of, wait, God's given me this. And that's worth a lot. God starts to reveal those things to you whenever you be thankful, and you spend time in his presence. See, that's the key. That's the goal right there. In order to get contentment, joy, and peace, we need to take time to be in God's presence. It's his Holy Spirit that moves on us. It's having that understanding that really we don't want what's in this world. 
We don't want to fit into this mold that the world gives us. We want to fit into the mold that God gives us. Because the blessings, they do come now, and they come after. They come now, and they come after. Whenever this world is gone, your reward will still be happening. We need Jesus in this world today. And we need to be the people that the Spirit of God is moving through to light into this world. If you would, please stand. I don't know why, but it was a burden in my heart. It's been on my mind for several weeks now, just being thankful for what God has given me. This world, whenever we look at the news, we can see a culture that's very unthankful for what they have already. They're not satisfied. But I tell you, if they knew God, if they felt the presence of God that you feel right now, it's a world changer. It's a changing thing to feel the presence of God and to entertain the presence of God, to let him work on our hearts, to let him show us new things from his word. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do what we've been doing. I'm going to say a prayer. And then if you would, after that, you can pray with the person next to you as appropriate. Family with family, group with group. And if you are alone, I'm going to pray with you up here. So let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you, God. I thank you for your presence. God, I want to thank you for this church, Lord. I want to thank you for every person in this church, oh God, for the blessings that you're given us. Lord, for how you've moved in our lives, God, how you've just blessed us with your presence, with this sweet spirit that we feel here right now. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for being a savior in my life, God. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for having an eternal reward waiting for me. God, I thank you for what you're doing. And Jesus, I pray and I ask you, Lord, that God... My life would be a light for those around me. I pray, Jesus, that I would have the contentment that you give and that your presence gives, oh Lord. I pray, Jesus, that you would give us strength. Lord, that you would speak to us anew. Oh God, that your words would move in upon our hearts right now. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for everything you're doing. Let your will be done in our hearts, oh God. Let your spirit move right now, Jesus. In your name, O oh Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's take a moment, church. Pray with the person next to you. Let's just spend a little bit of time in the presence of God together.
Jesus, hallelujah. Mm. Let's pray and dismiss them. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for today. I want to thank you, God, for the saints that are here today, Lord. I want to thank you for every person that's reaching out to you, God, that's receiving your word, that desires your presence and your spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would go with us this week. That, God, there'd be a special spirit of thankfulness that would come over us. That, God, as we thank you, Lord, that we would feel your peace. God, there'd be a joy that would come in that you give, that you provide. Lord God, we love you. We trust you. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And I do want to announce, as we're closing here, we'll be sending out an email soon. We are updating our, um, our new database for contacts to be able to send you emails like we do for Saturday night prayer and Wednesday night teaching. So if you would, um, as, the, as the email comes out this following week, please respond to it accordingly. There'll be descriptions and, and there'll be instructions of where to send information and how to get it to us. It'd be appreciative as you help us out in that matter. So Lord bless you real good. Smile at somebody as you leave. Encourage somebody from a safe distance. And uh, don't stick your tongue out. Maybe once. Sister Lowe has caught somebody. <laughs> Alrighty, Lord bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>